the auditorium at Coppin State University, and we had seven churches gather in there together with over 40 different nationalities, nine different languages were spoken from the stage, all praising the name of Jesus. And it was just a just a joy to be able to sit back in a room like that at such a uh, important institution in Baltimore City. And so to come out of that and then to come into this space with you guys, I feel treasured. And so we're going to walk through some intentional living, but I also want you to know that I've had twice as much coffee as I should have today. <laughs> so um, my son graduated from uh, Cape May um, Coast Guard this morning at 11 a.m. And, and so he's on his way to Oregon to uh, rescue uh, fishermen off the coast of Oregon and Washington State. Um, and so if any of you like to go boating, I highly encourage you to stay away from there, the base that there's, um, uh, commissioning him to uh, averages about 600 rescues a year. So um, if you need to, if you need to do the math, it's almost two a day. Uh, so they're pulling people out of the water on a regular up in that part of the state. So this morning, I, I cried for like three hours already today. So if I just start crying, give me a minute. <laughs> um, and just, just like some of you that have um, some paternal ac activities, just come up, hug me, whatever, and we'll get, we'll get back on track. I will say, though, it was exciting to see all the middle schoolers and high schoolers in your room. Yeah. Uh, for 15 years before coming to Baltimore, I was a youth pastor in Cincinnati, Atlanta, and Charlotte. And so to come in the room and just see so many young people, I have to admit, when I saw them leave and you guys were praising all these other people, I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, like the average age of the room changed drastically. <laughs> and so... Um, so I, I am looking forward uh, to us being together tonight. And I, I'm also looking forward to causing what I feel like is in some ways healthy tension. You know, when you go to a physical therapist to rehab an injury, they generally push you to certain points of discomfort in order to get you back to full potential. And the thing I love about Forge Road Bible Chapel is you have a, a, like a, a team of elders that watch over you and they care for you. They teach you. I've had a chance to go online and, um, and do some YouTube videos of some of the teachings from your elders. I've also, back during COVID, I actually had a chance to join you guys on Zoom one Sunday. Some of you be like, oh, maybe I remember that little square in my computer. That was me. I, I enjoyed <laughs> only seeing myself and Tom on the screen and not really seeing many of you while I was teaching from my home during COVID. Uh, but if you and I are going to learn about God through the scripture and you're good, like, and as you, as a, a church family, you're, you're taught verse by verse through the text. And if you're going to have that type of <laughs> biblical understanding, at some point, that storehouse inside of you has got to like spring water outwards at some level. Like you can't continue to be poured into with the renewing of your mind because you're starting to think and, and, and pursue your love and your joy in your relationship with God because he's become so alive in your relationship with him through God's word. And so now this weekend, I want to kind of push you because I'm, I'm going to say that maybe you might need to figure out, well, why is it that I, I still hesitate to want to talk to people about my faith? Isn't that the evangelist job description? Like, should we not do another Franklin Graham event or something like that? That way I can at best just invite somebody to a stadium and let somebody else tell people about Jesus. But if you go back and look at the last 52 Sundays of your teachings, you've had enough to already know that you can engage with somebody about your faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. So I hope this weekend to create a little bit of tension to say, all right, it's time for you to feel like we all have been asked by Jesus to go. We've all been asked by Jesus to look at people in the eye and let them know of the Father's great love for them. Now, Acts chapter 2 was not the Holy Spirit coming and only finding extrovert disciples. <laughs> the 120 people that were in the room waiting because Jesus said, wait, was, were, were sitting in that room and not all of them had the vocal capacity that Peter did. But they all stepped out of that room and started making an incredible difference for the kingdom of God. Now, how many... 
sermons had they had? They had about three years of Jesus' teachings, which was pretty amazing. Most of them, being Jewish young men, knew the Old Testament much better than you and I would, but they had a huge foundation in Scripture. But when the regular people of Jerusalem looked at them, they were like fishermen, you know, tax collectors. Like There was almost this lower society of people that were now empowered with the good news of Jesus, that they were considered unlearned and uneducated individuals. So something happens between spending some time with Jesus, your understanding of the text, and for them, they understood mostly the Old Testament because the New Testament wasn't written at the time. And then they had the Holy Spirit come and do something in their life, and common, ordinary people began to change the world. Like, you and I are here tonight because they faithfully obey Jesus Christ. So who's going to be in this room 10 years from now because you and I faithfully obey Jesus Christ? That's how the church continues to thrive. And so I want to use a fishing illustration. Now, the ladies, this is not time for you to tune out. Some of you are better fishermen than men. Um, and I know that Jesus told us he was going to teach us how to fish for people. But tonight, I want you guys to understand when, when, when we talk about fishing nowadays, like my son and I won a fishing tournament in Patterson Park Pond. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Like, Tochterman's down on Eastern Avenue, which is an amazing place, by the way. If some of you need to drive into the city just to buy your fishing gear there and then leave very quickly. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I loved about that time, we had one hour to catch as many fish as we possibly could. And my son caught 35 and I caught 37 fish in an hour in the pond. Now, maybe been the same fish over and over and over again. <laughs> but the thing about it was, is we were using something like this where you just drop it in and literally seconds later, you're pulling out a fish at best the size of the palm of your hand, right? And it's like the bobber just hops there just for a second. You're like, oh, it's like you just pull it out and it just goes flying. And, and, and most of us think that sharing our faith in Jesus is fishing like this. Now, how many of you like to go to Ocean City, Maryland? All right, sorry. Um, <laughs> but I'm an Outer Banks man like uh, Tom is. I love going to the, the to the to the Outer Banks, uh, Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hawk, Nags Head, all the way down to Oregon Inlet, whatever. But so in Ocean City, when you get to the end of the the, the boardwalk, what is encased at the end of the boardwalk? Does anybody know? It's a shark, and you know that a lady is recorded as catching that shark. And have you ever read the caption? It says that she literally fought that fish for three and a half hours. Okay. Now, how long did it take you with the accident today to drive here from Baltimore? Like it took me almost three hours from Philadelphia. So when we left Cape May, I had to drop my um, soon to be 79 year old mom off at the Philadelphia train station. So I, I waited for the, 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 the nine crescent train to get her to Lynchburg, Virginia tonight so that I could get here. And so when, and I'm thinking, oh, an hour and 45 minutes, I should be there. Like nearly three hours later, I'm like, man, am I gonna get there in time? But when you start thinking about what three hours in time is now, I have bigger fishing rods, but they're in the Outer Banks because fish around here aren't big enough for the bigger rods. So this is the largest rod I had at home. All right, so imagine when you are deep sea fishing. How many of you guys Wicked Tuna fans? Anybody? I, I don't, oops, I shouldn't mention TV. I'm at four rope. I don't know what TV's approved. <laughs> I don't know what kind of movies you watch. Like, all right, there was an episode of Brady. It's not Brady much. All right, when they were, uh, they were fishing. So when you go fishing, especially for a shark like this lady caught off the uh, Ocean City, she didn't just go out there with a rod like this, like a shark would tear this up. Like the rod, the reel would have been easily five or six inches bigger in diameter. And the pole that would have been easily two to three times the size of this. So this is just much larger than, than this. Okay. So I, I want you guys to see that when you go shark fishing, would you want to do that by yourself? No. no, no. Even if you could. Now, mind you, when you hook a shark, much like the one in Ocean City, there's a harness that's actually, like you have to have a harness. And they lock the rod with straps so that, because any human being is going to go against a 2,000 pound fish. 
when you weigh 125 pounds, like, you can just do the math and realize that you are way out-muscled, way, like there's no force in the water that you're gonna stay in the boat. And so they literally attach you to the boat with several other peoples, and there are times where they're, they're pouring water on your reel to pull it down, because when you hook a big fish, you can't just yank on it, because if you do that, you could snap the hook off, which is crazy to think about. The size of the hook is like the size of a bear claw, but yet a shark can snap off. Even the a hook, when you go into talk to you can see shark hooks, you're like, man, there's no way this would ever break. But yet, if you put the wrong amount of tension after it's been set, it could be broken. And it's the same way when you go out fishing for sharks, that you're not just going to go out and attach a dead fish to the end of your line and drop it in the water and expect to catch a shark. There's times of the day that shark come around. And so somebody on the boat has done enough fishing or research that they know the time of the day, they know the depth in the water, they know what to do to prepare the water around the boat, if it's an area where they're allowed to chum or they're not allowed to chum or however it is. Like They even know the types of fish that they're eating on a regular basis. And so you could spend hours just preparing yourself to have an opportunity to land a shark, let alone all the gear, the thousands of dollars invested. But once you finally hook it and you're literally pulling on that bad boy, imagine three hours, three and a half hours. You can go online and find people that fought sharks for five or six hours. You can watch an episode of that Wicked Tuna if you're allowed to watch it and realize that sometimes they fight those tunas for five, six, seven hours to get them to the boat so that they can have a fourteen to $20,000 payday. I mean, like that's a pretty good percentage if you can keep the fish attached. But the problem is in our faith, this is too much work. Like we don't think about fishing for men and women or children with the type of effort that would say, well, what time of day? How deep? What bait do I use? Who's going to help me? Like, what season of it is? Like, am I even healthy enough to go out and fish? <clears throat> because you can't put yourself in a situation in many occasions to go out and get a big game fish and to hook it and to hold on to it and to fight it for hours unless you have done a lot of intentional preparation. I'm going to set this down. Thank you very much, uh, Karen's husband. <laughs> uh, and so uh, with that, let me say this. One of my favorite parables, I love the Gospel of Luke. I love Luke's Gospel for many reasons, but one of the reasons is, is he wrote this letter to one person. He loved Theophilus so much that he wanted to write a personal letter to him recording everything Jesus had done and taught as best as he possibly could. And then he loved Theophilus so much that he went ahead and wrote him a second letter called the Book of Acts. And so we have these two books of the Bible that were written to one individual that for thousands of years we've all been blessed. Because he wanted to continue to show his friend Theophilus everything Jesus was continuing to do in the Book of Acts. And so for us, when we step into the Book of Luke and in Luke chapter 10, there's a famous story that I know that you've been taught, a famous parable. And it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so in talking about our perspective tonight, I want to read this parable, knowing that you've been taught it well. And I just want to highlight a couple of things to lay a foundation for some things that we're going to do the next three sessions. And I am going to ask you to bring a pen, especially for tomorrow and tomorrow night, because there are going to be some activities I'm going to ask you to do during the teaching to, so that I can get some immediate feedback if you're tracking along with me. But starting in verse 25, it says this, and I'm reading out of the NIV tonight for you. And it says this, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law? He replied, being Jesus, how do you read it? And he answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, 
Well, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down. Like, this sounds like a great answer, doesn't it already? Don't you love it when you ask a question and people don't give you a direct answer? Um, I'm going to leave that alone because I know we have married couples in the room. So, <laughs> in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went, went away, leaving him half dead. Now, let me just stop here just for a moment. There are a lot of colloquialisms, idioms in the English language. There's different places you go in America, and people will say things that mean something geographically. Um, you know, things, there's jokes about, it, like, you know, there's sweet tea in the South and there's sweet cornbread in the North because, you know, we put our sugar in different places. And, and a lot of times, like, you'll run up somebody like, man, I'm so tired. I just feel like I've been wrung out and hung up on the, the clothesline. And you're like, what does that mean? You know, it's like, and so there's things that people say regionally that we call in the English language like an idiom or a colloquialism. This beaten until he was half dead is a Jewish colloquialism. This really means that this individual was beaten so severely that unless you looked under the garments, you would not know if they were male or female. They were beaten so severely, you couldn't tell which wealth class they were in, which would have been very important in that day and time. Being able to judge what they were wearing to know, well, does this person have value in the society or not? Are they a foreigner or are they a stranger or are they somebody that we should care about? And so to have a language or a word like beaten uh, to the point of half dead, I want that to set off radar that this was an individual that was beaten so badly they were nearly unidentifiable, so much so that you would probably have to try to figure out a way, how do I even check a pulse? That's how badly beaten this individual would have been. So a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to, to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now let me stop here just for a minute. A lot of times when you hear somebody teach this, it's let's bash a priest, bash your Levite, and celebrate a Samaritan. I just want to say, just for argument's purposes, you can go back to some Old Testament texts and justify why they would not have touched a, touched a body that they didn't even know was if it was dead or alive. And so we might have feelings about whether or not they should have done something or not. But the point is, is that to Jewish religious people, they would have been, well, was this person really living or were they dead? Because had they been dead, they would have not been able to perform their job for over a week because they would have had to go through ceremony and cleaning, washing. Like, so the argument for me tonight isn't to touch the issue of the Old Testament cleanliness and all of that. I'm just gonna leave that up for you guys to do a little bit more research or talk amongst yourselves. I wanna focus on why the Samaritan was posed to this scenario. And so, it goes on to say, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, like, tend like tenderly caring for this individual. And he went to him and bandaged wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Which means he literally set this man on his donkey, and he walked while the, the wounded individual was, I guess, in a donkey ambulance. <laughs> the next day, he took out two denarii and came to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which, well, let me just stop here now. That, there's so much there. Because had this man incurred debt for his stay, it would have been legally acceptable for the innkeeper to then determine how long this man would have to work for him to pay off the debt. And the, the innkeeper would have had all the power. So, oh, you went three days over, you got to work for me for a year. Like, it, it, and, and, and legally, this wounded individual would have been bound by the debt. So this Samaritan was smart enough to know, I don't want in helping this man to actually put him into a bad situation. So he's communicating, I have got this guy all the way to health. All right. 
So Jesus then says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? Remember, the first question was, who is my neighbor? Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, before I jump in, let me ask you guys a couple of things, because this, this, is, this, is, this is important. So this is a call and response. I want you to tell me the thing that first comes to mind, just out loud, all right? We, the, the teenagers are gone, you're safe, all right? <laughs> so the first one I want to say is, I can't wait to eat. I am so with that ice cream person. Chick-fil-A. I'm actually over that right now. I'm traveling so much. I'm like, ah, Chick-fil-A is so easy. All right. Um, all right. So, okay, we weren't up. All right. That's good. Decent response. So the second one is, who's the best team in the world? Wow. That's actually impressive. So do you guys have like a charter that says no Yankee fans? <laughs> Can't cheer for the Eagles or the Steelers. Like I mean, that was. I, I, what were you cupping? What were you saying? You you the birds. The birds. Okay. All right. Uh, only Orioles around here. That's good. That's good. All right. Let me do the last one. You guys ready? Last one. Who do you hate? The Orioles. <laughs> the Orioles. Very good. So we found the Yankee. All right. All right. So. A lot of times in a call and response, it's really unfair to the audience because the person speaking, like it's also one of those things where like, you know, you know, people in my position will stand up and be like, okay, repeat after me. You're like, wait a minute, put it on the screen first. Let me read it. So if I want to repeat after you, right? Like, have you ever been placed in an awkward situation where you feel like, I don't know what this person is going to ask me to say. And so similarly in that exercise, you don't really know what I'm asking. But I asked the specific question, who do you hate? Because this, the parable of, the good, of, of this good Samaritan really has a lot to do with how we hate people. You know, I don't know if you caught it at the very end of the text. Jesus specifically called this man a Samaritan numerous times throughout. Like he didn't just say, well, the man continued to put him on his donkey. The man chucked him into the inn. He continually said the Samaritan got off his donkey. The Samaritan tended to his wounds. The Samaritan put him on his donkey. This, like the, the, the name Samaritan is used redundantly, but look at how this legal expert responded when he says, well, who was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And he says, the one who had mercy on him. Why wouldn't this religious leader say Samaritan? Because Samaritans were hated. Let me, let, me, let me ask the question about who you hate differently. Who do you call X? So there's a joke in my family. Like, I had a girlfriend before my wife. Like, <laughs> she was not my first girlfriend. She wasn't, right? All right. We'll be married 30 years December 17th. Okay, listen. 30 years ago. 33 years ago, I was still with this woman, right? We were engaged for nearly three, like dating and engaged for like three years of college before we got married. So we got to go back 34 years to get to Susie. <laughs> my family, my kids that are 25 and 21 still bring up jokes. About, they never met Susie. <laughs> and they talk about the ex of mine, right? My mom. Bless her heart. I just put her on a train. She's somewhere now in Northern Virginia on her way back home, hopefully. Um, but uh, it bothers her. Like it's, it's, it's just weird. It's like somebody sat her on a wasp when you start bringing up Susie and stuff like that. It's just, it's, just, it's just crazy how when you label somebody your ex, now a lot of times we just say our ex, right? So no matter what age you are in the room, like there's exes in our lives. Like you might have an ex-employer, you might have a, an ex-neighbor, you might have somebody like a, a relative that you might not call them ex, but you might be like, yeah, your brother. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, the one that shows up at all the family events. Like they have names, but we don't call them by their names. We label them something else. 
And it's a testament to how we really feel in our heart about people. I mean, just some of you, I can tell by the look of you, you lived in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> you know, you know what it was like when there were water fountains for some people and not for others. And there were bathrooms that were for some people and not for others. And, and you were in school segregating and, and you saw what it was like when, like you go back and you look at Christian school charters. Most Christian schools charters date back to the 60s and 70s when school integration took place. And, and so there's all of this stuff that's happened even since we've been alive to not call people names, but we call them names. Does that make sense? Like we don't call them by their names. It's, so it was, you know, it's it's you know, it's that it's that guy from Africa, or it's that 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 Mexican that works down the street. But they have a name, and many times we know their names, but yet we don't call them by their names. We identify them by something else. And the tension that this religious leader would have had in saying the name Samaritan would have been much like going back in the United States when whites and blacks would know, would, couldn't integrate and it was racial tension. And then there, was, there were words that emphasized what race you were and how we spoke about one another. And when I talk about changing our perspective, if it is Forge Road Bible Chapel's desire to learn to intentionally live in the United States of America right now, you will bump into somebody in the other political party. <laughs> I'm not assuming that all of you are in the same political party, but we will. We'll bump up against people that don't necessarily vote the same way that you vote. And they're going to live on the same street as you. And they're going to put different bumper stickers on their cars. They're going to put different yard signs in their yard. They're going to wear different clothing around you. There's going to be times where they, that people around you are going to choose to express themselves differently. I was watching a major news network recently with all of the drama that was happening on college campuses, especially associated with the war in Israel and Gaza right now. And one of the commentators made it his point to say, look at how ridiculous these kids look. Like, what did it have anything to do with what they were doing? He's like, look how crazy they are. They got green hair and they've got rings in their noses and they got rings in their ears. And I was like, isn't this about kids that are passionate about whatever it is, whatever side of the law has nothing to do with what they're wearing. But it, when you get fired up, and you let the emotions in you get rolling, you will let things roll out of your mouth that you would never say to their face, at least we hope not, but it reveals the work of Jesus that still must be done inside of us because we do carry hatred towards people. We do carry prejudice towards people. We're human after all. Jesus died for a reason. And, he, and a lot of times what keeps us from sharing the hope in Jesus Christ is we haven't let Jesus complete the work in us. We haven't allowed Jesus to get inside of us so much so that we'll come up to a story like this of the parable of the Good Samaritan and say, God, who is it in my life that I hate as much as these people hated Samaritans? Maybe God has placed them with a property line that you share. Um, one of my friends is an attorney, not Tom. Tom is a friend and he is an attorney, but I have another friend that's an attorney as well. It's like, it's good to have lots of them. <laughs> Especially when you're trying to do ministry in Baltimore. But he ended up representing uh, some people on Gibson Island. And they had millions of dollars. And they were literally spending their money just to aggravate each other where a guy was building a building on the property line so close that the guy was challenging it. And because he challenged it, he decided to start another project and get the crew to show up even an hour earlier so they would start banging earlier to continue to, to bother him. And then he got crews that would work on holiday weekends so that it was all intentional. He paid way more money than he should because he had a lot more money than he should, but he only wanted to use the construction on his property to totally tickle off his neighbor. And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, so my friend's making money because these guys are using their money 
to get under each other's skin when there are people that are hungry all around us. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is just the most ridiculous waste of time. But how many times in our own little worlds do we allow our anger and our rage to well up inside of us that we are missing out on opportunities to get people together to say, you know what? I need to show the love of Christ to my neighbor. I need to show the love of Christ to um, somebody that I'm working with. You know, I, I need to show the love of Christ to the people that are mowing my lawn that might be from a different country. I need to show the love of Christ to the people that own the restaurants that I frequent every week. And, and so we're going to talk about how we use that intentionality, how we, la how we labor together in, in our intentionality so that we can exude this image of Jesus that attracted sinners to Christ. I mean, Jesus had so many meals. There's a fantastic book by a pastor out um, in the Midwest. I can't remember which state he's in. I feel like I want to say Oregon, but that's just because my son's going there and it's on my mind. But he, uh, his name is Aaron Chalmers, and he wrote a book called Eats with Sinners. And so he parallels all the meals that Jesus had with people, and then he basically taught his church how at the end to use a recipe to invite their church over to sit down around the table so they could have a meal together with people and begin to talk about Jesus Christ. It's one of the best books that I've read in the last 15 years. I would highly encourage you guys uh, to jump into something like that. But when you, when you find in this Samaritan, he had obviously managed his time, he had obviously managed his money, and he obviously had a plan in his back pocket. Like he may have been the type of person that can come up with a plan on the fly, but there is such a strategicness to this story that coming on a somebody on the street, he was totally ready to respond to the need with his heart, his mind, his soul and his strength. And he had margin in his life in all of those areas. And may I mention, he had margin in time. When, I don't know how many years ago it was, I feel like it's like nine or 10 years ago. We used to, we had nine, we've had 19 meeting locations in 16 years. And we've been in one location now for nine years. So most of those early years we were, because we had a, we had a policy as a church because we didn't have a lot of money um, that the places that we met had to either be free or cheap. Um, and so we would meet wherever we could for as long as we could and try to save as much money as we could to, to help people. And rather than paying astronomical amount of money for rent in the downtown life, we were in party rooms and pubs. We were in hotels that were not using conference space and they would be generous with us. So we, we met in a, we even met in what this sweet family in the Harbor East didn't come to our church for almost a year because they walked by our church sign and they thought it was a crack house. <laughs> and so they wouldn't come in. But when we moved across the street into the broom corn building, they came and they're like, oh, this is what was going on across the street. I'm like, yes, yeah, exact same thing. Just clean your floors. Um, but uh, so we had so many different places. We were like, you know, if you can find us, we'd love for you to worship with us. But in the process of all of that, what it allowed for us to do is to constantly be available to people. Now, with our time and with our money and with, our, uh, with the plan, uh, this Samaritan was allowing himself on the spur of a moment to be with somebody. And so one of the families that was integral in the early parts of our ministry was leaving their home because this location that we were in at the time was the Pier 5 Hotel in the Inner Harbor. And so they had gifted us this space we were able to use incredibly cheap. It was beautiful. Like three quarters of the room was all glass. I don't know if you've ever been in that space for an event overlooking the, the red lighthouse that's on the peninsula there. And so they were supposed to, he was supposed to play the bass in the band and she was our gallery kids, one of our key gallery kids workers that morning. And they came out of their house, Bible in hand, guitar in hand, and the woman next door was crying on her steps. And so they were in a tension moment. Well, do we go love God at church or do we love our neighbor? We've got responsibility. Like we're not just taking up a seat on this Sunday or do we take time? To, so 
band practice came and gone, no Michael. Kids ministry came and it came around and, and um, no Raquel. Uh, and so we're getting ready to do the benediction at the end of the service. They come in the back, sit down in the back row, and then as soon as the service over, they run up and they start apologizing. Pastor Ellis, we're so sorry we let you down this morning, but we came out of the house and, and my, our neighbor was crying and, and she had a need. And so we just didn't feel like we could say, hey, we'll see you later. We're going to go to church. We'll come back and meet your need later. And they met the need then. And so I just want to tell you guys, when Jesus shortened all of the laws of the Old Testament to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, they are at times in tension with each other. Because in our thinking, I only can love God at church. Or I only can love my neighbor when I've scheduled it. You know, and sometimes you're going to have to make a decision. Is God wanting me to have a moment where I am doing something for him that might make a believer upset with me? You know, or I might be neglecting a responsibility. And so our faith in, quote, evangelism, in sharing, has got to be something where you and I begin to start evaluating the way that we're living, breathing, and moving in our own circles on a regular basis. And so tonight, I want to leave you with four thoughts that I would like to carry into the rest of the weekend based upon the Samaritan. The first is this, the first intentional step. You and I have to get to know Jesus. Now, I want to say this as respectfully as I possibly can. I don't want you to necessarily be able to recite the 66 books of the Bible. I don't want you to know the delineation between the Old Testament books and the New Testament books. I want you to know Jesus. Because sometimes some of you are getting so distracted by getting to know this that you miss out on the Jesus that you and I are supposed to emulate. We are so Bible study driven. So I have to get together with other believers and, and parse the scriptures together that you don't know how to talk to people outside of a Bible study. And Jesus learned how to talk to people that were never going to go to a Bible study. And there was something about him that you and I have got to get to know because when you and I read the Bible, the, the bad side of it being in print is we treat it like every other book in our library where you can open it up, you can go to a chapter and you can study it without understanding the person that you're in the relationship. Because you understand this is a relationship with God. <laughs> when you're here, this is you and God talking to each other. This isn't just you getting to know old historical Christian facts or old historical Israel facts or old. His this is the living and breathing, moving God, interacting with people from the origin. And you and I now get a chance to join into that conversation with God. It's relational. Like you can sit down and have a moment in the scriptures and you can walk away like, oh, my goodness, the living God talked to me. The living God spoke to me. Like it wasn't just academic. It wasn't just I just learned about the Sermon on the Mount. There was something that was almost as intimate as somebody wrote you a letter and said, I love you at the end. And you wrote a letter back and you felt like there was a response to that. And there's an intimacy that's taking place when you and I learn to approach the scriptures like this is my time to have a relationship with the God of the universe that sent Jesus Christ so that. I could be saved from my sins, that I could be given armor to continue to live in a world that is anti-God so that I can promote God. Like he gives us tools. Like I told the church last Sunday, when you read Acts chapter two and the early church is booming out of the upper room and the, and the power of the wind and the spirit and the people hearing in their own languages and 3000 are baptized in this first day. Every other chapter in the New Testament is so that you and I can explain what happened in Acts chapter 2. Everything that you read 
from Acts 3 all throughout the rest of the New Testament is Peter, James, and John explaining to you and I what Jesus did predominantly in 60 days. Like decades of writing about what Jesus did when he taught before he died, when he died, when he rose from the dead, when he ascended, when the Spirit came, and the rest of the New Testament is to help you and I understand what that means for everybody. How we can fight about the fight in the internal battle of our old self, how we can grow in the new person that God wants us to be. And so when you and I find a story, this parable of the Good Samaritan, we find an opportunity for you and I to say, how well do I really know Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ somebody that I feel like I can intimately call my savior, my friend? Like he told his disciples, like, listen, we're, we're now friends. We're friends. I'm not just your professor and your student. Like we're friends. We can talk. We can spend time together. And when I, you spend time with me, you're good for other people too. The second thing that I want to push us to this weekend is we must pray that Jesus will use the spirit to open our eyes to truly see others. When was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit in a time of prayer to help you to see more clearly? We really, even the older I get, the more that I think I see, and then I realize I really need the help of God's spirit to help me see. There's, there's so many things that even happened in these last few days where if I took things at face value, I would have been so wrong. And just a few probing questions, I realized, oh my goodness, my perspective was way off. So many of the people around us, God is illuminating like this man beaten half dead that he wants us to get down and give our time, talents, and treasures to, but we are not seeing them. So we're going to talk a little bit about praying for our eyes to see this weekend. We're also going to talk about this third thing. We have to change how we budget and steward our money. Do you guys want me to tell you which day we're going to do that so you can skip? Um, then the fourth thing we're going to do, we're going to talk about um, how we, you and I have got to slow down. We are way too busy for people that don't believe in Jesus. We, our schedules are so packed. Um, one of the things that's a benefit for my wife, Ginger, and I now that my son graduated today is we are, what well, should I even say it out loud? <laughs> please, please. We're empty nesters, right? Like this is, this, is, this could be freedom. <laughs> this, I mean, this, there is, like I have not known hours of my life to be mine. Like, no more going to hockey around the mid, this mid-Atlantic, Ohio, North Carolina. Like, no more weekend hockey trips. Like, it's, I've got hours of my life back. Like, this is, this, this could be really, I got, I've got fly fishing gear I'm going to use. Like, this is great. This is great. But I also have more time to say, Lord, okay, yes, I give 60 hours a week to the church, but how much time do I really give to the people on my way? My neighbors. I had a beautiful conversation over an Amazon package with Matt and Claire, who are my neighbors next door, um, because he had heard some things going on um, in our house, and, and come to find out, you know, he was hearing our excitement over our Pentecost service that we had last Sunday, and and, um, and for like 20 minutes, I got a chance to get a glimpse into his church hurt and his experience with his parents and grandparents. And so we're going to be having a meal together, hopefully next week after things settle down with my son. And, and we're going to get a chance to talk about Jesus and his hurts. Like, and, but mind you, I live in a row home, so our walls are really thin. He might want to talk to me about a few other things, too. But, um, <laughs> but we're, one of the things on the agenda is Jesus. And so you and I need to understand that we've measured our lives so much up to this point. Why can't we take and measure it again? For instance, how many of you in here have a college degree? All right. Anybody have a master's degree? Postmasters work, any of you? Okay. All right. So there's, there's a lot of you that have gone out to get a lot of serious education. You had a plan to pay for it. You had to plan to go and take classes and do the work plus provide a living. Like we're, we, you and I can get a lot of things done when we choose to do so. 
Um, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, it's my desire this weekend that we would take those same skill sets that got you to the place where you are today to say, how much of my time do I need to start to reproportion so that I can start to tell people why I believe in Jesus? Let me pray. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would help change our perspective, that you would help us to team fish. Lord, we want to fish together. We want to learn to measure our days. Father, we want to assess the situations happening around us. Father, we need to, to focus on knowing who Jesus is. We need to have our eyes opened. We need to be honest with you about who is holding our resources. And Father, we also uh, need, out of love for Christ, to be so moved with compassion that we're willing to readjust our calendars. Uh, so Father, uh, guide us this weekend. And Father, thank you for such a beautiful place to come to. It's been nice to step outside and not hear traffic. Um, so Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in the stillness of this space in the laughter and the bonfires, Lord, as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.